My name is Arianne Johnson. I just want to first thank you, Julia, for tailoring this particular uh, discussion perfectly for my own personal life intersection. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's just really convenient to be here. Um, I am one of the I am one of the students. I am an MDiv, um, and I am studying Islam in my MDiv degree. Um, and I entered the school with a lot of this angst and fresh, you know, lots of excitement about figuring out how to how to go about doing interfaith dialogue. Um, and in the process of my three years here, I'm a third year student writing my thesis currently, um, I have shifted a little bit and I had a summer internship at the United Nations this past summer and now I'm feeling really drawn into this conflict reconciliation mm -hmm. thing. Um, and so my own project right now is to try to think about how identity plays into reconciling um, situations of conflict with religion as a as a forefront sort of discussion, which I wasn't really seeing in the political sphere um, when I was working in the UN um, as much. So I have three questions for you. Are you ready? <laughs> uh, first of all, it has to do with um, what you were just talking about, about forging your own sense of career in the fruit basket. And um, as we are going, the, those of us here who are going into pursuing new careers, um, how much in your perspective right now as established career-holding people, um, do you think my generation should be focusing on kind of fulfill, looking for, finding, finding positions that will fit our interests or forging our like, new ones? Um, new paths, new, finding communities that might, that might need our voices and seeing how we might go about constructing our own sort of initiatives. And like, what's the practical reality of that? Um, the second question is, as I'm taking all my classes, I'm wondering in, in your worlds, how much is your energy dedicated to deconstructing and how much of it do you feel is about construction work? Um, it's one of the questions that comes up a lot in our student stuff. Um, and then just, just the third question, how is it that we might be able to contact you personally? <laughs> um, if we would want to, you know, like throw out a couple thesis proposals your way or something like that, is that possible? Go for it. <laughs> well, the, well, to answer the third question first, I'm sure we'd each be happy to be contacted. Uh, um, we can't hide from you, can yeah. we? Age of new technologies. <laughs> too, too late for that. Uh, um, so your first question about practical realities, I think. Um, the, we struggle with this, actually, within my organization, which uh, is... Um, you know, trying to carve its own path in a field that's just emerging, um, which uh, uh, never has enough resources for, uh, um, you know, to meet the demand there is for uh, requests for assistance. And uh, one of the ways we specifically struggle with it is through our processes, you know, that we've been involved in throughout the world, there is a younger generation of, you know, of, of practitioners developing uh, people who've, you know, in local stakeholders who got involved in, you know, the processes we uh, help support in, in those regions. Uh, uh, a couple other, you know, young people, not from, not local stakeholders, but who, uh, you know, went through a graduate pro program and got attached to us somehow and desperately want a career path in this, in this field. And it's not really a field that offers, you know, clear-cut career paths just yet. Um, and, it, and it may never. Uh, who knows? We're trying to solve that. We're trying to, you know, raise money to, to make that possible. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, my take on the practical reality thing is, um, and I very much experienced it this myself, this, you know, kind of twisted career path and fruit salad thing had a, 
had a practicality logic to it as, as, as well. Um, I have a family and, you know, and so forth. Um, but I'd say, I, I would just in personally encourage you, tilt in the direction of forge. You know, we need people to yeah. forge. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, the people who are really feel driven in, it's not even drive, it's just can't help it, right? You know, just have to do this. Uh, find a way to forge, and, and so as yet, I think there, you know, it, in the field we're talking about, you know, it's, it's not, uh, in, in the law practice side of my life, uh, there's a set system for people coming out, of, it's kind of a factory, right? You know, you go to law school, you, you, you're a summer associate, two years in a row, you get an offer from a firm, Hopefully it works that way, you know. But um, there's a very set path, um, less so in this domain. So, you know, the, it, ultimately I think each individual has to come up with the answer to that. There are places like units within the UN and whatnot that you've, you know, that you probably know about now where there are a few career s slots, but they're few and far between in this field at this point. Just to add to that a little bit about your question about deconstructing and constructing, I think if you end up choosing to earn a living in a mainstream institution, as I have, that is I get a salary from a university, I spend an enormous amount of time in the deconstructing side of things and deconstructing the things that I was taught and did teach and need to rethink because I've spent a lot of time on the ground not constructing, but accompanying local people who are doing the constructing. Bringing what, some of the resources it seemed to offer, scaffolding, for example, of ways of thinking critically about issues that might not be as available to local Mayan communities in rural Guatemala, or yeah. that kind of thing. So that's, they're constructing, and I'm accompanying that process and trying to figure out what I know that might add to that, give something um, along the way, so um, I think that the, the the decisions about whether to join an organ join a, an organization that's doing something and try and w work with one's restlessness from that base also carries with it. And I've had to discover this along the way that that you owe it to the institution in which you're located to push your restlessness onto them too. Because if you don't try and push the edges of them then what you're doing stops when you stop doing it as opposed to actually influences. I mean, my sense of life is that I have learned an enormous amount about people whose voices don't travel up as much as people are willing to listen to my voice. And so I need to open spaces where those people can speak their truths. And so the way in which we understand psychology, for example, shifts based upon the majority world, the global south. Um, so that deconstructing and constructing, I think, is, is complementary, can be conflictual. But I also want to say that one of the things that I do think is very characteristic of, of your generation and the one that follows you is that kids learn how to start organizations now in the seventh and eighth grade. They get to high school and they've already, you know, they didn't just do the lemon stand, they turned it into something on the web. And so there is this sense of, you know, always having to start the new next thing. And I sometimes want to encourage people to look around, yeah. find this organization, figure out what they're doing, and see if what you're interested in can complement, add value to, or sometimes there are things that, you know, bring your vision into some of the things that are there and help those of us. I mean, one of the things that's really, you know, deeply problematic sometimes as I go to places and do things and there, there's loads of people there, but they're all my age. And that's just not a good thing, you know? So we need this, the, you know, we need this intergenerational, this is a great intergenerational space right here. We need more of these. Mm -hmm. Great. One more question? Thank you again. My name is Chris Hansen. I'm MDiv 2010. And it sort of goes with the constructing, deconstructing question. But 
Earlier you mentioned that you must work within systems and outside of systems, and it's something that I've always strongly believed in. But that's also a very lonely space because you're constantly being judged by those in the other space that you're moving in and between. You're very much uh, you know, betwixt and between, uh, to borrow from MDiv time. But uh, how do you cope with that? Because I very much, in the, the social work that I, social justice work I do, it, it can also be a very alienating or lonely experience because you are constantly darting in between uh, sort of this established network and then also outside of that network as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, I can answer that. I can identify with that. Um, I think part of how um, it, it, uh, one possible language for it is finding allies, finding other people who are darting between those spaces and not expecting to find accompaniment in either space. I think that's what is very challenging. Um, and, you know, I've had some experiences where all I could do is go into the room and close the door and cry because they have been so painful of, of what you would, you know, of people who, of being in places where you think that you're working alongside and with people, and because of who you are, let's say in El Salvador at the time that the U.S. has just bombed the villages there, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what your solidarity is, it doesn't, you are from the United States and your government just killed hundreds of people, and so people are going to treat you like they never met you before, like you're a really oppositional figure. And so having spaces and places where other people are doing similar things, and believing that there are other people to do similar things, because one of the things I've learned about white privilege, and I keep having to learn this, is that um, we think we've, especially if we think of ourselves as progressive, we think we've got it together, and none of the other white people in the room have it together, right? <laughs> and that means we don't look for allies. We rather somehow, even though we don't mean to be saying I'm better than you, but we communicate that. Mm. Or we communicate, you know, you have to, you know, you can't get married, you can't have kids, you can't because you have to, you know, do whatever, the movement. or, And that's just not good vibes to be giving off. So I can, uh, you know, I tell you, I've been there, felt that, and it is, but it's not a lifetime of loneliness. I mean, there are lots of people out here. It's a question of, you know, finding them, and then you have to nurture that connection. And, um, and that, you know, takes time, but it's also fun. And uh, the other thing is, I really do think you have to figure out how to have fun in this kind of work, because if you can't have fun with people, and, you know, I grew up not really laughing much at myself. I have really <laughs> learned how to laugh at myself over the last 30 years. And it's a really good experience, and it's good to laugh, because, it, you know, it sort of gives you more energy. Do you want to add to that, No. I, um... I'm not sure how to answer it because I just see it so uh, unavoidably in the nature of this work, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, in, I, actually I see it as the work, you know what I mean? It's like that, that's, uh, uh, it, it, this, this work is ultimately about, uh, you know, I don't know what word to use, but it's 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 uh, it's um, forging relations, developing, uh, helping people, you know, think out of the box, whatever, exactly at those you know those those seams or those seeming points of disjunction or discontinuity, and so it just seems like you know you're you're describing for yourself, you know, you're just in harm's way of that. You know, and uh, uh, and and I I think that uh, is a you know is uh, uh, yeah maybe a, a lonely space, but a, a also a very social space in in some way, a space where you know uh, y y one is sort of uh, uh, privileged to 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 participate in and even help n initiate conversations and point out things that. Uh, or inv invite people to see things that, 
might appear rather obvious from that space, uh, you know, in between or bouncing back and forth, how you put it or whatever, that might might uh, not seem as obvious to people who do that less. And um, uh, so it's a real space of opportunity too. I, you know, I think, and and that that that's a great compensation for whatever kind of discomfort one might feel in that space. In my experience, too. So. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time for this component of the evening's program. Um, I, I do want to thank you both so much for making the time to spend with us this evening. It is so generous of both of you. And on behalf of the, the school and the Alumni Council, um, I'm very, very pleased to give you these tokens of our appreciation. Um, these little HDS plaques. Thank you. Yes, oh, thank you. Um, so, <laughs> so um, I'm going to invite uh, the vice chair for the Alumni Council up to give a closing final moment of reflection. And then following that, uh, I'd like to invite everyone um, out into Andover Hall for a continuation of our celebration and for some refreshment and conversation in more of a casual way. So thank you, Sarah. Good evening, I'm Sarah Taylor Peck, the Vice Chair of the Alumni Council. Thank you both so much for your reflections tonight. We planned this event as a beginning for the alumni and the current students and the community members at Harvard Divinity School. And so as you can see, we've picked this theme for the year that starts with values, and we picked two speakers who shared great values of peace and restoration, of bringing people together, of giving voice to important issues that we all care about. And then we asked them to share their stories about putting those values into a vision, casting a vision for their life, and sharing a little bit about what we might call their ministry in organizations like the Center for Human Rights and International Justice and the Peace Appeal Foundation. So I hope that for all of you, as we heard their values, casting of their vision and how they put their vision into action, that this is a stirring and an invitation and a beginning for all of us to do the same, for all of us to think about where is the call, where are the questions, where is that whisper nudging us to be also agents of change mm -hmm. and agents of vision and action? So we anticipate good dialogue on this subject in our reception. All are invited, and we hope that you will meet us there. Thank you. Thank you.